Ni hao, Juan Ling, Juan Ling, to wake 2021. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on the time zone you're living in. And welcome to Wake 2021, the World Artificial Intelligence Conference. Today, I'm very proud and honored to moderate a panel by the name, The Role of Artificial Intelligence in the Era of the Digital and Ecological Transition. We have a very good panel of amazing guests, very different background, top level, and let me introduce the speaker. We have Fabio Moyoli, Head Consulting and Service at Microsoft, Luca Pontecorvi, Head of Structuring Italy at Enel, Charles Yap, CEO and Co-Founder at Clean Robotics, Stefan Veran, CEO and Founder on NYSE, and Oscar Ramos, Director, here I have to repeat myself, Oscar, and uh, we also have Oscar Ramos, Vice President of China Accelerator and CISOS V Venture Capital. The Managing Director of China Accelerator and Partner in SOSV. I can write I can write it for you if you want. It's easy. Okay. Oscar Ramos, Managing Director of China Accelerator and Vice President of SOSV Venture Capital. No? <laughs> Partner. Yeah, it would be best if you have written this. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm writing that. Yeah, sorry about that. So. Yeah, you have it there. We also have Oscar Ramos. We also have Oscar Ramos, Managing Director at China Accelerator and Partner at SOSB. So, we are really in the way, in the worst of uh, a very important moment, I think, for digital and ecological transition. Uh, as you've seen, the COVID has introduced a new wave of digital investment and opportunities in uh, the ecological and green investment. Just to give you a few ideas and numbers about the, the, the numbers that, that are concurrent to investment at the moment, not only the EU Green Deal is reaching up to 1 trillion investment in the green sector. Uh, about 500 billion are coming from the EU, EU budget. 280 billion are coming from public and private investment and 100 billion from national, national co-financing. Uh, overall, Biden, uh, sorry guys, but I, I really have problem to, to, to read the notes behind the, the screen. So let me just uh, repeat everything from scratch, right? Fortunately, I'm used to use uh, like four screen usually, and uh, this time I have only one screen, so. Uh, okay. So uh, when a few weeks ago, the, the WAY conference invited me to discuss about these topics, I was very honored to help this uh, topic about green investment. And I thought, why we don't have a panel explaining the importance of investment in the green sector? After all, the EU Green Deal is uh, building up investment to, investment to up 1 trillion only in Europe, half of which is coming from the EU budget, 280 billion from the public and private sector, and 100 billion from national co-finance. In the US, Biden is planning for a, for a clean energy revolution and allocating more than 1.7 trillion over the next 10 years. And we are still discussing about the commitment of China to reveal how the environmental and social government will assess the importance of this investment in the next years. So I would probably start with a round of question to the person that are more active in the green investment. For this, I will probably give uh, the first question to Oscar Ramos, director of uh, China Accelerator, uh, which is also one of the biggest VC and accelerator investing uh, every year in more than 150 startups. Um, I will ask to Oscar, how do you see the artificial investment and green investment coming together over the next year? And where do you see the, the most of the value of the early stage startups in this new investment environment? 
Thank you very much for uh, for uh, for the question, uh, Manuel. So uh, for us uh, at, at SOSB, um, climate technology, green technology is definitely a top priority. Um, recently, we we did a study on our own portfolio and, uh, and identified some of our top companies that uh, in the area of uh, of climate tech and green tech, finding that uh, that we're probably one of the most active investors in the world in that area. Um, with over 150 companies only in that uh, in that space, uh, covering different areas from uh, from uh, energy, food production, logistics, etc., and uh, and working across multiple multiple um, multiple technologies, ranging from uh, more biotech that normally requires a long time to produce hardware that might require a bit more time to deploy, and then we we end up in the software space. Where, where obviously uh, that's where the artificial intelligence uh, falls, uh, falls as, the, as the core technology that can drive a lot of value. One of the things that is very interesting of artificial intelligence is uh, the speed of deployment, is the capacity that has that technology to learn and evolve and improve constantly. It has uh, an, an, an ability to, to apply itself to multiple industries where we can see improvement in efficiency by nature. When we're talking about, about, um, about uh, reducing uh, carbon emissions, when we're talking about improving, improving efficiency, being able to optimize processes is critical. And, uh, and that's where um, China is also quite an interesting uh, market because the, the dimensions of everything in China, the scale of everything in China and the access to data with, uh, with sometimes uh, a lot of uh, smart um, uh, hardware elements and sensors across the whole chain for, from production to distribution to, to warehousing, every single element allows us to have a lot of data points that is critical to be able to, uh, to produce any value. That's one of the reasons why um, increasingly we are more and more actively looking into companies in this space. And, uh, and we're seeing how um, as, the, as the Chinese economy transitions from a, from a, a more cost uh, cost advantage driven to a more efficiency and more value driven economy, all of these elements become more and more critical. That's pretty awesome. So I see there are you know, a lot of connections with the new AI also application in at the edge of let's say digital and physical where you mentioned IoT. Uh, I, I must say also in TechBricks, we are also very active with this type of uh, high deep tech technology integration and we are using a lot of unstructured data. So talking about this, I know that in a few energy companies, these uh, type of applications uh, are becoming, let's say, mainstream. And I would like to pass the word to Luca Pontecorbi. Luca, you have a PhD in biomedical engineering and also a master in quantitative finance. So you come from the quantitative uh, part of the research and that you've been applying this type of concept uh, more and more into the energy sector, something that I also was used to do in the past as I was also a trader and risk manager myself. So I would like to ask Luca, um, what do you think are the energy markets fostering the green energy transition and what are the future developments? And if you want also to start discussing a bit more about the AI application in this sector. Yes, uh, sure. Thank you, Manuela, for this for this question, and thank you for having me here. Um, starting from uh, the application in the energy market, uh, I would say that uh, one of the most uh, interesting application in the energy sector is uh, for the collection and the forecasting of uh, meteorological data. Um, it seems quite uh, far from the the world of energy, but actually, uh, if we talk about renewable. Uh, comes to our mind uh, one of the first connection with uh, with uh, weather data and actually be able to um, collect and uh, forecast this kind of information is something that is really critical really important in uh, energy sector um, up to now just to give you an example one of the one of the tricky part of the one of the most hard part of our of the story speaking about renewable is uh, to estimate uh, and to forecast the production of an hydro plant. It seems a quite easy problem, but actually uh, when you have to uh, estimate the thickness of a snowpack, for example, 
uh, up to now, the best way to do that is the, the physical one. So you have to go there and you have to, to uh, measure the thickness of the snowpack through a probe. Uh, recent research are trying to use the satellite photo uh, processing and integrate this information also with, uh, with drones information. And the idea is to take photo and understand the thickness of the snowpack. And actually, from my point of view, this is amazing because we are switching from a physical information, something that you measure on in loco, to something that is uh, more related to, to IA. Um, actually, this, this is an example of what is happening in, uh, in our history. It's just one of the, the sample of, uh, of what, uh, what uh, the, the, this kind of new technology is applied in the energy market. Another one comes from uh, an example that I can give you comes from my background, as you say, I said, in the trading. And uh, right now we are using a complex system that counts the number of time that the word is used in the, in the news. And then connect this information with, uh, with the price change in the market. And the idea is to understand why and which kind of effect have I use on the price. And this is... Uh, so again, it's something really new and uh, it's amazing because you are trying to, to connect uh, a qualitative uh, information to, to a quantitative one and uh, have a lot of impact and it's uh, uh, a, huge, a huge change in, uh, in the, our daily job. That's a very nice application and uh, I don't know if you heard of uh, one of our startups, Alpha Edge, you kind of gave me a good assist because we are trying to develop something very similar also with the earth observation images in one of our startups. So it looks like there are very good applications also in the energy sector. And uh, I will move now from energy to you know a large site of application that probably for IT giants like Microsoft are at the edge of discussion right now. So I will give the word to Fabio. Fabio, let me just introduce a few words about Fabio because uh, his uh, curriculum, his CV and experience is outstanding. Uh, Fabio has a Master of Science in Computer Science from Politecnico di, uh, di Milano and MSc in Ele Electrical Engineering uh, by the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm. Uh, now he's Head of Consulting Service at Microsoft, but he has been also by President Capgemini, Associate McKinsey with a, you know, a very long track record of experience at the edge of uh, both academic uh, research, applied research and uh, industrial world. He was also a, a member of uh, Forbes Technology Council. And uh, when he has some spare time, and I wonder how he also enjoys writing articles uh, on artificial intelligence to more than 260,000 followers on LinkedIn. So I, I guess you have, uh, you know, your day full of discussion about the role of you know uh, edge technologies like artificial intelligence in many sectors but i would like to ask fabio uh, you think artificial intelligence has really the potential to achieve a green transition in several fields of environmental policy and where do you see the highest potential of this application thank you manuele and again, uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you today, with all of you. I, I, I really think that, um, that the application of AI uh, in at large in uh, for helping our planet uh, hurt and uh, for helping uh, really the challenge that we are facing as a uh, with I mean as in this challenging era of our history are really immense. I mean, it's difficult to cover the infinity application of AI. It's a little bit like, you know, electricity is the general purpose technology. It can be used uh, everywhere. I really, the friend from Enel shared some very great example of how it can be used in a specific context in the energy sector. For sure, energy is a sector where there are many, many applications of usage of, of, usage of AI, but moving to a completely different sector, there are a lot of application in the smart city cognitive building that we are seeing uh, using AI to optimize energy in the building to uh, use energy when the, maybe, you know, do with the proper forecasting allocation when there is uh, green energy available, moving to a completely different sector in agriculture. We are doing a lot of projects in the precision agriculture domain where with AI, you may increase productivity of the soil using less water, using less pesticides with a great benefit that you can imagine. In the ocean, we are doing a lot of very nice projects related with water, with clean water, for instance, ocean cleanup. 
It's a project that uses machine learning to identify plastic pollution in the rivers, and it simulates how it moves in the ocean. And that basically, this inside power plastic cleanup system to help remove plastic that really impact our ecosystem. Talking about the ecosystem, there are a lot of projects that use AI for zoo diversity to, to really attract uh, uh, species that are at danger to disappear from our planet and to recognize different uh, single individuals, how they move, uh, so to track uh, the movement, to protect them. I, you can use AI in, uh, for instance, in Amazonia to understand if there is a, someone cutting a tree in a place where it's not allowed, because with AI, you can easily, easily understand uh, the, uh, recognize the noise of someone cutting the tree from all the many noises that you have in Amazonia. And I could continue for hours and hours with a lot of different examples, really from a completely different field, because I think that this is the most interesting thing. There is not probably one single application, but it's really the amount of diverse application of the eye that all together can help us saving our planet. That's amazing. Thank you so much for your overview. I think we can go more in detail maybe uh, in the second part of the panel where I will let all the speakers interact a bit more on where they see the edge of application of AI and technology in green tech and uh, in the ecological transition. Uh, for the time being, let's talk with Shar. Shar Yap, you are the co-founder and CEO of Clean Robotics, which I understand is a company creating sustainable and innovative tech-driven solution to persistent environmental problems. So, can you give me your angle on how do you take all uh, ecological challenges with the use of uh, cutting edge technologies? Sure, yeah, thanks for that introduction. So I, I think it makes sense to introduce what our company does and our core technology before kind of going into my take on sustainability and ecology and artificial intelligence. So our company makes a product called TrashBot. It's a system that uses AI, robotics and computer vision to detect waste as you throw it away. And it can separate any two, three, or four streams 300% more accurately than the public. So in the United States, most commonly, that would be landfill, recyclables, and compost. In other parts of the world, it might be some combination of those three, maybe an additional one, uh, you know, any two, three, or four streams. The interesting thing about artificial intelligence uh, and solid waste management is, you know, I think of our company primarily as a software and a data company disguised as a hardware company. And the reason for that is uh, most of our customers um, really see the value in the data and the insights that we can provide for their operations. Uh, for example, with major international airports, obviously they care about diverting waste from landfill, but an even larger concern that they have is tracking how much carbon they're able to offset and abate through different types of sustainability initiatives that they take. So our technology is able to, using very simple rules of thumb and benchmarks, uh, account for the amount of carbon that is abated by every one ton of recyclables that we're able to sort more effectively than the public. Uh, and that's just one application. Artificial intelligence can be used for other things that can serve as carrots or sticks to further drive sustainability. For example, we are collecting data on every single item of waste that goes through our fleet. And that information can then be collated, aggregated, and parsed out in a way that regulators can then use to either enforce extended producer responsibility schemes or to reward you know, good actors. Likewise, that same data and the same artificial intelligence uh, frameworks can be used to empower consumers, for example, to track their own uh, waste footprint by extension, their carbon footprint. And artificial intelligence can also be used to recommend more sustainable products, more sustainable packaging. And it really can uh, enable the public as well as regulators and private companies to make better choices. And so I, you know, uh, kind of echoing uh, Fabio's remarks, the, the, the magic of AI and the promise of AI is that it's a multi-purpose general foundational technology that can be used across industries by different types of stakeholders uh, to, to drive sustainability and, and really make an impact on, on the climate and uh, environmental crisis that the planet is facing. Thank you so much, Char. It was very interesting to understand what your company is involved in. So from one certain entrepreneur to another, let's say innovation guy, Stefan, I understand you always been uh, uh, kind of fascinated by the relation between information and energy, which is a very interesting topic that we want to address all together today. 
and you are now CEO and founder of Enwise, which is a company providing clean and affordable energy powered by AI. Can you explain a bit more how your company is tackling the energy challenges with the AI at the moment? Okay, so uh, I just would like to start with a question to all of you. What's the difference between a traditional fossil energy and renewable energy? What's the main difference about it? I might answer that, you know, the source of energy, the way the initial source transformed into energy and the ability to make some work and power. Yes, but, and something we can note about it is that why we started with fossil energy is because we have a much higher density of energy in fossil fuel than in renewable energy. If you just have wind or biomass or even sun, it's actually a very, very, a form of energy that's really not dense. But if you have some oil or some coal, it's extremely dense energy in terms of how much energy you have per unit of volume. And this changed a lot of things because when you have fossil energy, you can have centralized extraction of energy because it's very dense. And then you will have centralized equipment to operate them. And then you will have centralized expertise to make it run. If we, when you go to uh, renewable energy, you need to be decentralized. Not because you, you like to be decentralized, just because the energy is very thin and you have to be a little bit everywhere to collect it. And with that, you need decentralized equipment. And with that, you need decentralized expertise. So because you have decentralized equipment, you should be very careful about your operation because costs can go very soon. So you should be able to have very lean maintenance, very well managed cost of total, uh, of, uh, total cost of ownership. And also you cannot afford to have experts everywhere. You need to have this expertise that is diffused along all your equipment. And that's where AI enters into place. Because by centering your operation, your design around data, processing this data, you're able to make very educated choice. You're able to optimize the maintenance, optimize the performance on a very uh, decentralized set of equipment and to be able to lower the cost of those clean energy. And, and that's what we do at NY. So we produce uh, energy from biomass in very delocalized uh, zones. For example, in food industry, like we collect some waste of uh, uh, like a potato, potato, very large potato chips manufacturer, and we are able to provide around 20% of their electricity just with their waste. But we cannot afford to have experts anywhere. And that's why our machine are all construct around data and we are able to manage them remotely through AI algorithm. And can you just give us an, an example of uh, what type of application do you think in renewable energy can be really aid by AI, just for us to understand yeah. better uh, what are the simple, let's say data, yeah. data science application of uh, biofuels, which is a, an interesting topic. And I will also maybe ask uh, if uh, I'm not going out of rails, uh, what if there is any you know, synergy also perhaps with the hydrogen applications? Yeah, so I'll just start with what, what we do. We, we produce uh, biogas from waste, and this is a consortium of bacteria. So you need to, to maintain a, a kind of environmental equilibrium between the systems. So in traditional centralized plants, you, you have some experts that are here that are trying to put the system so it's okay. But on our system, we just manage it remotely. So the system just learn the reaction of the bacteria and keep them, keep them in the optimal way. And this is, so this is the big things, but it will also come with predictive maintenance. We are able to foster if equipment can go wrong and able to, to act quicker. So at a lower cost, so we can lower the cost of this energy. Thank you very much. Of course, this is not like a pure uh, energy panel. I come from the energy sector and I would be also kind of interested to understand uh, compared to biofuel, how the maybe the hydrogen developments are kind of uh, uh, you know, going towards the same challenges uh, 
in, let's say, in uh, artificial intelligence. I might say that one of the main challenges that I see, of course, is relates to what you, Stefan, just mentioned, which is decentralization. Uh, most of the supply chain and, you know, the application of hydrogen, I think, will be like self-sustained economies. And to this extent, I see a lot the potential of also digital hubs to, let's say, make more efficient the decentralized the station of hydrogen. And that's, of course, applies also to other type of renewable energy application like biofuels. So it was very, very interesting. And congratulations for your venture. Uh, let's get back maybe to the investor side. So Oscar, back to you. Uh, we have seen a round of very interesting discussion about applications of uh, startups and even large giants uh, challenges in the corporate innovation like Microsoft for uh, uh, digital artificial intelligence application, the energy and the green uh, uh, sectors. Where do you think there are the most, let's say, uh, the biggest opportunities for early stage investors at the moment to deploy, let's say, deep tech application also in the energy and green transition? which is a topic that in Chaprix we are really, really committed to. Well, I mean, uh, we, uh, um, as you mentioned, I mean, you, you're still talking about energy. We're very broad in terms of, uh, of the type of, uh, of industries that, uh, that we cover. So for us, uh, when we look at, a, at, a, at, a, at an opportunity, we are not looking for opportunities in a specific industry. So when we think about, uh, about uh, green technology and, uh, and carbon uh, uh, emission reductions we're looking at, at everything from uh, from the production to the to the uh, all the distribution last mile uh, consumption and that could be around any single element that could have impact in the whole in the whole value chain additionally we do that globally so even if I'm based in Shanghai and obviously a lot of the investments that uh, that we make they have a very strong very strong uh, uh, Asia angle in, in what we do because we're based here and, and being here we are able to see opportunities and spot opportunities that sometimes are, uh, are not uh, are not visible and especially for early stage technology companies uh, one of the key challenges that, that they always face is uh, um, the fact that they have to convince whoever needs to adopt the technology that what they bring is better than the legacy infrastructure so it's, it's always easier when, when there's nothing and then you bring in um, something that will create a lot of uh, a lot of efficiency that when there's uh, something that has already been uh, um, deployed, something that already someone has made an investment and you need to make sure that that doesn't doesn't return an investment before you make any any changes. So from that point of view, um, the the need for sometimes optimization from a more uh, emerging market, a more developed market, it comes in a very different way. Um, in one case, sometimes it comes more pushed by regulation and a, and a demand even sometimes from the consumer that is uh, is demanding um, more more green in the core of, of the companies, whereas sometimes in, um, in, in the emerging markets, this comes uh, at, a, at, a, at a need to try to make sure that things can be sustainable, not just from a, from a green perspective, but from an economic perspective. No? And, and that 360 degree um, opportunity, I think is quite, uh, is quite interesting. And it brings a lot of, uh, a lot of options for, uh, for identification of potential, uh, of potential investments. That being said, um, right now we are uh, we are uh, seeing uh, changes, and, uh, and obviously there's there's some dynamics that are that are very strong in uh, in the in the market. So uh, the growth of uh, of electric vehicles, the the growth of uh, of automation is uh, is something that uh, that is driving a lot of change, and we see a lot of opportunities in um, in these areas. Opening these uh, op th this wave of opportunities is uncovering also another layer of, uh, of options that sometimes are, are hidden behind the, behind the quick wins that you can achieve with, uh, with very simple initial integration of, uh, of technology. And what is, what is interesting is how we are seeing more and more uh, multinationals understanding that, uh, that sometimes the real innovation, uh, the real innovation it's not just the invention, it's not just the R&D driven creation of new technology, but the application of this technology in a way where you can address specifically 
um, a problem in a very um, in a very practical way that can uh, that can drive clear value for uh, for the user, clear value for whatever type of challenge you are trying to address, and in some situations even just the business model and the pricing model that you define could be critical for the success or the failure of, uh, of companies. And that's what we're seeing uh, increasingly more and more um, large organizations exploring these opportunities to work and collaborate with, uh, with the smaller companies that can bring these, uh, this alternative way of trying to create value because obviously um, the type of, uh, of R&D budgets that large organizations can, uh, can have um, are in most cases inaccessible to, to smaller companies. That's an amazing perspective. I thought you were talking about application in the VC and startup world, but actually you give me good access to pass the word to Fabio back again and uh, see the same uh, type of question from a more corporate angle. So what do you think instead for a corporate are the real challenge of the, you know, the green transition and how to use also your internal knowledge, collective knowledge and technology to address, to address these challenges? Uh, I think Oscar made a very good point, which is, you know, the applicability of solution. Uh, I know by working also with large corporates that usually, you know, the, let's say this, the, the, the technology readiness level of the MVP is a big concern for big corporates who want to take less risk in the early stage application. But perhaps a giant, a giant like Microsoft uh, has also its own, uh, let's say, innovation strategy to get the most out of the early stage startups. So just give me your view, Fabio. Thank you. Thank you, Emanuele. Uh, it's okay if I just close the windows because there is a lot of noise, sorry. You sure? We will cancel this or we'll just keep it for... <laughs> okay. We, took, we take advantage that it is registered, I think, Emanuele. <laughs> sure, sure. Perfect, okay. So I so, so I can start now with with the answer and we probably just cut the uh, the uh, part where I mean, there was really a lot of noise and don't know what happened. Okay, so, so clearly the I mean any environmental uh, priority is becoming uh, I think of paramount importance for any company. I think it's nothing that we are sharing here as a news. It's something that is happening, maybe with different sensibility in different parts of the world, with different industry approaching it in different ways. So there is still a lot of diversity but it's really gaining importance and importance. And I think that we need to look at it from a top down and from a bottom up perspective, meaning that for sure, governance is key. I mean, having the endorsement from the top is important. And uh, this is often very much focused in many conversations like the one we are having, but reflecting on what Stefan was sharing before on the distribution, let's say of uh, they need to uh, have, uh, again, a, a more distributed approach, uh, more involvement or, at all layers. He was talking about energy production, but I think that we could reason in the same way, a little bit about everything. I really see that uh, the future we're entering require each people in an organization to take accountability for energy challenge. It not, it's not something that is enough to be covered by the general manager or the board. Because more and more, a lot of decisions are distributed, and uh, this is something really facilitated by technology, because it's really with technology, it's easier to distribute decision, to share data, and it's really, uh, it's happening everywhere. Like, uh, even it, from an urbanistic point of view, I think that we will see more and more decentralization somehow, because, you know, you will be able to have good uh, deliver everywhere with drones uh, and with a self-driving car it will be more convenient to uh, move because you can do anything while you are moving because the car is driving itself and you can work remotely everywhere we have seen it a little bit with covid pandemic but with a mix of reality that is arriving so with uh, again we will be able to work as holograms uh, collaborate with others and you see all of this will make everything more and more centralized and I think it will apply to the energy production, but also to the organization of companies and uh, uh, at large, uh, also then to the implication that uh, we have to consider when we face this challenge. So uh, we sometimes talk about uh, let's say a democratization of technology, a democratization of the empowerment, but also about citizen developers. It's like, you know, every person should somehow be able to build his and her own uh, AI application to solve uh, 
is of her own challenge with zero code or low code. And very often, maybe some of these applications may also have some environmental benefit, uh, like you know, uh, helping uh, to fix lo local challenge. I think again, we need to empower everyone to contribute in this. It's not enough to have uh, the board of the organization uh, caring about it. Uh, any special program you can mention? I have heard that uh, Microsoft, was, of course, is trying to get the neutral parity very, I don't know, very soon by 2030, if I'm, uh, if yeah, I'm sure. We have, I mean, as Microsoft, we are, uh, I mean, on our own, we have a very ambitious target and we have, we are carbon neutral already since a while. We've been carbon neutral across the world since actually 2012, but now we are committing to become really carbon negative by 2030. Uh, and uh, promoting sustainability at large and with really uh, low carbon business practices globally. And it's a lot of things related to this. It's about our own operations on our data center, like building data center on the, you know, behind the water on the ocean for, I mean, uh, so that we use uh, cold water in the ocean to a refrigerated data center, for instance, it's about the way we are investing in sustainability in our product, in our services, in our devices. Uh, from SARS to Xbox with our eco-friendly material uh, and again, producing them, cutting energy consumption, reducing physical footprint. It goes into the project we are doing with our customer partner. I mentioned a few of them earlier, but a lot of projects related to helping our customer actually becoming carbon neutral as well, or carbon negative. And then really a lot of projects that we are doing. I mentioned before a few of them, but it's very really large. For instance, we are doing with a, a world mosquito program, just the first thing that came to my mind, uh, where we are using um, Acres of Asia, our AI model, to, uh, to understand how mosquito moves uh, and uh, uh, how they transmit diseases. And then we can use AI for uh, fighting, let's say, diseases brought by mosquito and uh, fight the dengue and other uh, bad things I mean, bad, uh, happening, especially in the poorest area in the world. And then we are using like Termi 5, which is another project that we are using uh, uh, machine learning to analyze the head pattern by pairing thermal cameras with machine learning and then uh, really helping uh, also in this case, fighting uh, diseases and uh, helping the planet. But it's really a lot of different initiatives. I would say that on one side is what we're doing inside our company to become carbon negative, but then it's a lot, I think even more interesting how we're using cast, helping customer to transform. We have to look at the entire value chain. Sometimes, you know, if you become really carbon, let's say environmental friendly, but your supplier and your customer are not, uh, when you take a more broader view, you are not for sure carbon negative or you are not helping the planet for real. You know, if uh, your supplier are doing something very bad for the planet. Even if you're not doing it on your own, I would not feel too proud as a company. So that's, I think, something that we should more and more consider. Of course, way, I agree with higher. this. And sorry for telling Microsoft going neutral. I forgot you that you already are neutral. I was actually meaning uh, negative, which is something that you're on the track of. And uh, I'm glad that you also introduced concept of the smart energy solution which I know that in Enel, as a, one of the you know, leader energy company, not only in Europe, but at the global scales, uh, smart energy solutions are, of course, uh, uh, a mainstream topic, Luca. So um, I would be really interested to know what, in terms of smart energy and energy management application you are looking at at the moment and uh, how these uh, can interact with also more, let's say, innovation solution from the startup world, perhaps or any other, let's say, exotic uh, corporate innovation strategy that you foresee in the global energy trading sector? Sure. Um, actually, I would like to, to bring a slightly different perspective, starting from what uh, Fabio just said. Um, we are speaking about the risk. Uh, it's not a weather risk, it's a climate risk. We are dealing in a situation in which we have uh, to do something. And actually, now we are speaking about technology and all this technology allows us to, to change our environmental. This is one of the first period in human history where we have the possibility to really change what will be our future. And actually this is a, a, a key point because change a lot of the perspective also in terms of the future strategy 
uh, from a corporate uh, point of view, of course, but also from an individual point of view. Uh, in general sense, when we spoke about risk, uh, we are thinking about the probability that something bad happened. And we always believe, like individual, but also like corp corporate, that managing risk means uh, change only the effect of the bad events in our life. Easy example. It's hot here, I'm going to move to the mountain. This is true, but nowadays we have, uh, thanks to the technology, we have the opportunity uh, and the ability to change not only the effect, but also the probability that something happened. And speaking about climate, this is quite uh, um, easy to, to, to see. Um, coming to your, to your question, of course, uh, Anna has put in place a lot of uh, initiative in terms of uh, electricity in order to address this, uh, this problem. We are reducing the fossil fuel production, of course, and the aim is to, to reach a sustainability of future and a sustainability uh, production needs. And speaking about smart energy, I would also take the, the assist of what Stefan said. When we come up with the renewable, we're speaking about uh, um, a spread, something that is not located in just one place. And here where we need something, a uh, tool that are very strong in terms of uh, calculation, uh, uh, power calculation, because we no longer will have uh, uh, a line, a production that is uh, production than consumption. We will have more like a grid. And dealing with this kind of problem, we'll deal with a problem in which we will have many markets that are intercorrelated and connect each other. And we be, must be able to analyze all together the system and must be able to adapt the system with the new, uh, new futures, the new, the new scenario. So um, this is maybe one of the biggest challenge and this is where uh, a corporate like Enel are investing a lot in terms of uh, initiative and innovation. I, I completely see your point. You know, once again, uh, I think, uh, you know, data challenges in energy are, of course, uh, one of the biggest, you know, uh, things at the moment. You know, we, we talk about data science, big data lakes that are coming from IoT and other devices. So I think, you know, the digital world with energy is going to be more digital at the transition between digital and physical. So um, I think, you know, forecasting, real-time forecasting and now casting using like also meteorological uh, applications and techniques will be the answer to the, you know, to the risk management and energy management in the future. You know, having good data, of course, is the first uh, aim for data intensive company. Uh, so I would maybe go back with Stefan and Char, that are the, let's say the more innovation startup guys at the panel and uh, I would just like to see your interactive perspective on how the new technologies are probably you know affecting all these energy challenges not only in artificial intelligence but also with uh, connected technologies digital and physical feel free to interact and start each other now okay let's start yeah, with uh, why is that the one to... it's a great question uh you know I think um kind of piggyback off of uh, Stefan's uh, description of decentralization on energy and the reasons for that, uh, specifically when it comes to energy density and like the requirements around uh, decentralizing, I think there's a number of other factors that uh, uh, kind of touching on Luca's point and Fabio's point, there's a number of other factors that are driving um, decentralization and um, by that token, um, sustainability. So obviously, um, there is a, and this is the kind of thing that enables the uh, ideation and the creation of a product like ours, like Trashbot. Um, sensors are becoming more affordable and um, more accessible. AI algorithms are also becoming more accessible. Um, computers like uh, that are actually quite powerful, like a Raspberry Pi or um, uh, other similar uh, platforms, are also becoming more accessible. And this allows kind of a broad democratization of technology development, and it also enables the deployment of even simple technologies that can be very informative uh, for any type of sustainability strategy. And you know, our product Trashbot is a, is a clear example of that. And so what's enabling or driving decentralization on the solid waste front isn't necessarily uh, 
you know, the same things that are driving it on the energy front, what we're solving is for contamination and human error that cannot be reliably solved at the recycling plant level. And therefore a robot that is more accurate at separating waste at the point of disposal makes a lot of sense. But these broader macro trends on uh, cost reduction, accessibility of software and AI algorithms kind of plays into the broader ecosystem around innovation and technology. That makes completely sense. And uh, from the pure, let's say, physical world, Stefan, you are, I think you're referring to the physical world and maybe approaching the digital as a consequence of the physical biofuel uh, source of energy. What do you think are the main technologies that are, you know, maybe concurring to sort out other problems than uh, data science problem with energy? Uh, basically, I would say all this, hello, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So I would say all this, um, this, like, basically, to get more sustainable, we can optimize a lot of things. And uh, so basically, was like all the logistic parts. We also care about energy savings. So all, all of this is uh, is can data have a, have a lot of uh, a lot of. Um, can be a very precious to, to help to optimize this flow. So like you were talking about hydrogen and the localized production of hydrogen back to energy, but how do you meet the needs and, and, the, and the production? And so this is all the logistics and of this, uh, of this flow uh, with smaller production. Uh, energy efficiency is a better way not to have to produce so much energy is to, is to, is to be more efficient when you do and don't waste the energy. And of course, this also all this technology, all those data have, are very um, precious for that. So as Charles mentioned, as uh, the cost of all these devices goes down, the availability of data goes up and it's opportunity to make some savings based on that. As a practitioner of that, and I think many people will agree about that, one, one thing is very hard actually is to name data. So, when you are in front of this big lake of data and try to, to do something out of it to optimize logistics, savings, it can be very hard to have a well-ordered data that you can actually make use of it. And, uh, and it seems a very small challenge, very simple things, but it's very essential. So um, the point of here is, Naming data and trying to have a way to organize it is, um, is a very tricky challenge that, that come above this uh, wide availability of data. Thank you so much for your perspective. So we are pretty close away from the conclusion of the panel. I would leave maybe the last round of discussion on a quick note on how this uh, uh, let's say not only the artificial intelligence, but also the other digital technologies are affecting uh, one uh, main investment sector that now is uh, trending up, which is uh, ESG, environmental and social governance. I think this is one of the most, let's say, ethical application of investing over the last, uh, let's say, years and will be the trend of the future. So just a quick note, any perspective of yours on uh, Invest on the investment side, on the ethical perspective, how AI and green technologies will interact together to build a better future. Yeah, I'm happy to give a quick founder's point of view. Um, so obviously there's, this is a, a, a trend that's been building up for a few years. And I think it's gonna hit a critical mass uh, at this point. And obviously you have some um, investors that are jumping on the bandwagon and they look at ESG as kind of an afterthought, really they're looking for an ROI. Uh, on the other hand, you do have some um, really substantial investors, obviously, SOSV is kind of included in that mix, uh, that are really serious about it and really driving it across their portfolio. The, you know, the 300 pound gorilla that comes to mind is BlackRock. Uh, and from the point of view of a founder that's drumming up business uh, with the portfolio of some of uh, you know, the holdings of a, uh, a firm like BlackRock, those firms are feeling the pressure from their investors, right? And so it's 
you know, whether they like it or not, it's opening up opportunities for uh, sustainable, innovative technologies to, to kind of find a foothold in the marketplace. So it's yeah. it's an interesting time to be. As you are pure, let's say, green investment, because now I have heard also this new term, greenwashing, which is basically sure. pretending that non-green investment are really green, so like fake green investment. So mm -hmm. that's something. Or even that... symbolic green investments, right? Exactly, exactly. To this extent, maybe Fabio, you want to give a view about Microsoft uh, ESG investment? And actually, I would like Manuel, maybe to comment on uh, your previous question where you were also mentioning other technologies uh, together with, uh, let's say, the ethical challenge and then go back to try to being a, a yeah, yeah, very quickly. We were just closing, when the, but you're free to give your view, Fabio, for sure. Uh, just mentioning that you know we were talking about artificial intelligence here, but there are so many other technologies that uh, have a big role in this. Uh, something, for instance, is will have a huge impact is quantum computing. It's a little bit outside of the conversation, but the the way it can help us that to especially you know in chemistry to maybe create uh, new uh, molecules that are able to uh, to fight the with the CO two emission to absorb the emission and. Uh, the impact on the uh, agriculture and so forth and so forth. So I really think this is a technology that has a huge potential when it comes to uh, climate change and uh, helping us saving the planet. And then there are other more technical, let's say, technology like blockchain and so forth that also can be used very much with AI. So just to mention that in this conversation, we talk a lot about AI, which is good because it's powerful, but there are many other technologies that will uh, collaborate or uh, reinforce the positive impact of AI. But I give you the challenge then to move from awake to a new deep tech or a green conference, maybe in the future where we can delve deeper into this uh, application, which are very, very interesting for sure. So just okay. a very quick uh, round, uh, round of uh, answers on SG investment. Uh, if you want to add anything, feel free to do now. Oscar, maybe you want to yeah. give this. I mean, for us, for us. This has been uh, obviously uh, uh, something that is quite consistent with uh, with our investment strategy. We has always been trying to address real world problems, and uh, and and assuming that that if we all really want to keep the world uh, as it is and make it better, uh, at least keep it safe, no, and maintain it, and, and and from there taking it better, you need to address these macro problems that exist. Uh, you need to address problems that are fundamental to, to people's lives. And, and some of them are, are critical, no? like, like food and, and agriculture is a big, big, big space where you are solving like a health, uh, hunger, but there's also a massive amount of, uh, of, uh, of energy consumption that, uh, that is, uh, is present in the whole, the whole food industry where you have a, a massive opportunity. Um, to to create to create impact. So I think from that point of view, it's interesting how, uh, as I was mentioning, no, you have that 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 emerging market uh, trend of, uh, of of sustainability coming because that's the way to go for them to be able to to actually exist. Uh, you have the pressure that is coming more and more from uh, from the from the public markets because consumers are demanding companies to be more responsible. And that responsibility comes at, at all levels, and that's where this greenwashing um, trend is also happening. Uh, but but consumers are, and and markets are eventually able to to understand who is actually doing this, and and then it's contradicting itself. I mean, who is trying to talk about it? Well, we are going to be trying to have the sustainable packaging on that side, but then uh, the way we produce all uh, all the raw ingredients for for our products. Are, are extremely polluting, and then there might be also additional impact in uh, in the way we do what we do. So I think that's going to be quite a quite an interesting. Uh, those are be quite interesting times. And um, um, obviously, I mean, I, I love technology. Um, I'm like uh, I think like like uh, like Luca. My PhD was also in biomedical engineering, which I think is an interest is, a, is an amazing field where you apply to healthcare or almost like software hardware. Um, in my case, a lot of uh, like uh, 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 signals and, uh, and and electromagnetism in my in my area of work. It was quite quite deep in in that area. And uh, and being in love in technology, I think that we also need to be open to the fact that a lot of the most impactful uh, opportunities that we're going to have in the application of technology, they are not going to come only from the deep tech side. They are also going to come from the simple application of technology and like rational efficiency applied to multiple, multiple situations where today things are just inefficient. 
um, being able to have like a, a better way to to move things from A to B, um, less ways to reduce like reduce the usage of waste. A lot of things are going to come without technology. And then in a second phase, when we want to consolidate, when we want to be able to take things to the next level, technology is going to be fundamental. But there's a lot of quick wins um, that can be achieved just by rationally using technology um, to up. Uh, to addressing some of these uh, world problems that are extremely important. I agree, I agree. Technology is a medium and let's say is the way to achieve also, you know, this uh, type of challenge. I think in ESG investment, for example, blockchain could be also with the aid of AI, be a very good evaluator of pure green investment. Now, that's another topic that probably we can discuss apart. Any further comment on the this environmental uh, and ethical I concern? Would... I would like to add something. I mean, sure, sure, um, Luca. Well, we we spend uh, this. Uh, we discuss a lot of technology uh, in this panel, and we see one common element of this technology are data, and how you measure it. When it comes to ESG investment, actually, one of the main, not problem, but one of the main issue from my side, it's how you measure it. I mean, you are speaking about maybe an investment that leads gives you value in, I don't know, five, 10 years. And uh, everybody knows that is something that is worthy. Everybody knows that is something that is needed, but actually how you can measure it, how can give you a value that is easy, a premium on, on that action. And just to give you a very easy example, um, in, six, nine, sorry, in 1654, uh, many times back, um, Galileo invent uh, the thermometer with air and uh, water. And thanks to this invention, uh, Grand Duke Ferdinando II found the first meteorological institution. Actually, um, as, as also Oscar said, this is something really easy. I mean, uh, they just measure something that exists, then it is very easy, is the temperature, but in the way that they apply the technology is something completely innovative. And again, we are speaking about data, we are speaking about uh, uh, a way of use something that uh, uh, had uh, always existed, but uh, we are not uh, that, uh, sorry, we was not able to, to, to use it. So actually, speaking about uh, ESG investment, I, uh, I see the same problem. I mean, we understand the problem, we uh, get that this is something uh, important, but from my point of view, we miss some kind of metrics in order to, to really evaluate this kind of uh, investment. I agree, I agree. Thank you so much for your insight. I will be literally gone for hours with you guys. It has been an amazing panel. I think I really have to thank uh, Wake and the European Online Forum for the ability to wrap up and gather such an excellence from very different perspective. Uh, I was, of course, honored and also a bit emotional seeing at the beginning uh, to introduce such an important topic. And my wish is that technology, and in particular AI, but also other technologies, will concur to get you know the best uh, results on these important challenges like the ecological and green transition. For the time being, thank you, everyone, and uh, have a nice conference with Wake 2021. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Pleasure, guys.